people were wanting to try and get more out of their religious life. And more importantly, they were wanting to live the religious life on their own terms. Welcome to 100 Years, 100 Objects. Stories from the collections of Lancaster City Museums. My name is Millie Wellborn and I'm a museum assistant for Lancaster City Museums. In this series, we're celebrating 100 years of our museums by looking in depth at 100 of our favourite objects and the stories that they can tell. Today's object is a tiny metal item which was part of someone's religious life until they lost it one day around 600 years ago. Today's object is a crucifix pendant. The crucifix is very small and you need to get quite close to see the details. It is only 3.5 cm high and about 2.5 cm across. It is a standard cross shape with trefoil terminals at the top, bottom and each of the sides. There is a figure on the cross with a scroll above the head. It is quite worn so that the details of the figure are mostly gone and the outer layer of the gilding has been rubbed away in several areas showing the base metal below. It is believed to date from the 14th or 15th century. It was most likely a pendant, as there is evidence that there used to be a suspension loop at the top which is now missing. After probably being lost by its original owner, it was found in 2009 by a metal detectorist who also found several other objects in our collection. We spoke to Dr Christopher Tinmouth to find out more about this object and the religious world that it was a part of. He started off by answering one of the basic questions. What is the difference between a cross and a crucifix? In short, a cross is a cruciform object which doesn't necessarily have any depictions upon it, whereas a crucifix is specifically a cruciform object with an image of Jesus Christ being crucified upon it. The word crucifix itself means one fixed to the cross in Latin. That's therefore the key distinction. You are looking at the human on the cross. In post-Reformation periods in Protestant countries, the cross is left plain, so that you are looking simply upon the cross and upon its, the significance of the word of God within a place of worship. Whereas to look upon a human on the form of a cross is almost to empathise with the figure on the cross and his sufferings. It may seem a very small difference, but this actually made a very big difference in the history of Christianity more generally. Back in the uh, 8th and 9th centuries in the Eastern Orthodox Church, there was a great controversy called the Iconoclast Controversy. Uh, this revolved around the contention that icons constituted a form of worship in themselves. In other words, they were a distraction from people worshipping God and they were worshipping the object. Eventually, a compromise was reached in the Eastern or Roman Empire whereby the image itself was not being worshipped, but it was a means by which people could choose to access the divine. Things didn't get quite so heated in the Western Christian Church. We find images of crucifixes from a very early period in Western Christian history, and arguably that helped people to form a much more personal relationship with the divine, setting the scene for later developments in how Christ was depicted. The cross and the crucifix were essentially the same type of object of devotion that they had been for centuries. Nevertheless, by the 15th century, it seems as though crucifixes were becoming more popular than crosses, at least as an item of personal adornment, such as the example that we are seeing here. By this time, people wanted to have a more individual relationship with Christ, to empathise in his sufferings, to hold him physically close, if you will. For instance, a pectoral cross was worn on the chest. That would be a very visible sign of a person's piety. In the Middle Ages, people placed a lot of importance on how people looked pious, as well as acted pious. And therefore, being seen to be pious was to have a quite conspicuous form of, of piety literally displayed upon your person. So if this is something to be worn publicly, to show that the owner was pious, who might the owner have been? It's likely to have been owned by a lay person. By the 15th century, the time when this object was created, 
a wider range of people were wanting to access religion within the context of their own lives. One of their chief means of accessing Christianity was by going to church regularly, once a week. He didn't receive the Mass or Holy Communion every Sunday. That had to wait until Easter. People wanted to try and get more out of their religious life. And more importantly, they were wanting to live the religious life on their own terms. If you're a, an ordinary person walking around Lancaster in, in circa 1450, you've got a priory church up the road, you've got a, a, a Dominican friary in Dalton Square, you've got a leper hospital on St. Leonard's Gate, you've got a whole range of different uh, religious options open to you should you want to go into holy orders, but you just don't have time in your life to become a monk. You just don't have the will within you to commit to living your entire life in the service of God. So uh, people want to try and live their own life, but they also want to have God as a big focus of their life. And what better way to do that than by literally bringing God within your own life in the form of a crucifix? It could well have been a person of the middling sort, maybe a merchant, given the value of the metal and, uh, and the portable nature of the object. This doesn't mean that this person necessarily had to be of a higher social class to afford this. The more humbler classes of people could afford an object like this, perhaps even handed down as, a, as an heirloom. By the 15th century, the value of wages is actually very high relative to inflation, and people have a lot more money in their pockets. Uh, this doesn't mean to say that, that they bought it simply because it was a fashion statement, it was the latest thing to have, but it was just as much an investment in their own personal piety. They imbued this object with a sense of numinous significance above and beyond what, uh, what we may see today. We asked Chris about the religious organisations that were present in Lancaster at the time that this cross was made, and their history. The earliest place of Christian worship in Lancaster was Lancaster Priory Church. Uh, that had actually been a religious site in the Roman period. The Principia, the centre of the Roman fort, is on the site where the later Christian church would be built. The Priory itself was established in 1094 by Count Roger de Poitou, the same person who built Lancaster Castle. He established it as a Benedictine priory, a monastic order dedicated to St. Mary, and it was established as a dependency, or cell, of the Abbey of St. Martin of Sez in Normandy, in France. Effectively, it was a franchise, an English franchise of a French mother house. The French connection would come back to bite the Abbey in the end. During the Hundred Years' War, the English and French would confiscate the lands owned by monasteries that owned land within their hostile neighbours' lands. And in 1410, uh, the same fate befell Lancaster Priory's Benedictine community. By 1431, the church was transferred from Sez to Sion Abbey near uh, London. And following this, there was a major reconstruction. Effectively from this point, it transitioned by the time of this very crucifix from being a Benedictine monastery to, a, to the parish church for Lancaster. The Dominican Friary on Dalton Square was first settled by the uh, Order of Preachers in 1260. These were a very different outfit to the Benedictines. The Benedictines were monks who sat praying nine times a day. The uh, friars went out and preached and moved about and spoke to the people. They were a much more active form of religious engagement. The site was later sold to Sir Thomas Holcroft after the dissolution in 1539. Finally, we have uh, St. Leonard's Hospital on the site of what's now St. Leonard's Gate. That was a leper hospital in the Middle Ages, founded by John, Earl of Mortain, the later King John, the man who gave the market charter for Lancaster, still in force to this day. It was situated next to a small beck which marked the boundary between the borough of Lancaster and the manor of Newton in Bulk Township. By law, leper hospitals had to be situated outside the town boundaries, and St. Leonard's was on the Newton side of the beck. The beck was called Jelly Beck in 1684, and today it runs under uh, Factory Hill, the road disappearing behind the White Lion pub. The hospital held only nine inmates. Henry of Grosmont, Duke of Lancaster, gave the hospital to the nunnery of Seton in West Cumbria in 1356, uh, just outside of Sellafield, and it later fell into decay as uh, leprosy declined by the later Middle Ages. In fact, by the later Middle Ages, leprosy had done a complete new turn. Previously, it had been a, a very virtuous disease, but by the 14th century, it had become a disease of the outcasts, which was partly why there was a real change in how people uh, viewed and therefore treated those people with the condition of leprosy.
Next, we wanted to know about how ordinary people, like the owner of this cross, might have practiced their religion in the 14th or 15th century. It really doesn't make very much sense to divide religion in the medieval period between how ordinary and non-ordinary people lived. We're all sharing the same Christian culture here. We're all going to the same churches. We've got the same God judging us. We're all going to go to heaven or to hell, regardless of which station we are at in life. There was a sort of radical egalitarianism at the heart of the Christian faith, but that doesn't mean to say that there weren't divisions that people constructed in how they chose to express and practice their, their religious faith. I mentioned earlier about people's willingness to go into monasteries and uh, commit themselves to the religious life. That was an option that was open to higher class and lower class people alike. If you were uh, of a lower class, you might well go into a monastery because you literally would be, would be fed and housed. If you were of a higher social class, you would go in as an act of sincere personal devotion. In other words, you have the ability to, to go down that, uh, that, that form of life. The monastic life wasn't the only thing that was open to people. People really believed in the value of good works. Now, this is the idea that you have to do good in order to be good. You have to be seen to be doing good in order for your, yourself to move upwards, literally up a sort of ladder of perfection. You can kind of, kind of think of it a bit like a, a nectar point system, really. Everyone's born in a state of sin, so you're already in the debit. Uh, but you've got to try and build up your credit score the longer and longer you live. You can do this in all sorts of ways. You don't have to go to a monastery banking your nectar points. You can also uh, spend your nectar points by uh, going on pilgrimage and walking to Santiago de Compostela and bringing back a, a siege scallop to show you've been. You have to show that you've done this in order for the church to kind of certify that you had done these good works. It, uh, people who go to the Compostela today uh, actually have a, a credential or a certificate to prove that they have actually done the pilgrimage um, and, and therefore they've attained the, the so many years of purgatory, if you will. Um, so there's a sort of sense of progression, but also a sense of regression in medieval thought. Everyone thought the world was going to end at some point. You just had to be on the right side. From the late 1340s, something occurred across Europe that changed how people looked at both life and death forever, the Black Death. We asked Chris if the experience of this plague changed how people viewed religion. Absolutely. And yet, not quite as it seems. People were still Catholic Christian after 1350, but they approached their religious practice in a very different way to how it had been before. A good quarter to a third of the population of the entire country were wiped out in this bubonic plague known as the Black Death. People had to come to terms with it in new ways. One way that they came to terms with it was by depicting death more within medieval art. It becomes a very prominent theme in popular practices such as the dance macabre, the dance of death, and it led to people beginning to aspire to a new way of how Christianity could be lived. Basically it threw into sharp relief the sheer injustices that were being seen in, in the church. In 1350, after having a third of the population wiped out, and you've also got a, a church which was split within itself, or about to be split. A period known as the Great Schism from 1378 to 1415 basically had three and one time four popes of the Roman Catholic Church, and each being given different allegiances. So as well as the political splits, you've got wealthy churchmen seen to be fleecing their flocks and enriching themselves at the faithful expense. Now you've got to bear in mind, if people are putting so much emotional and financial capital in spiritual aids, they're, they're going to be very resentful of these rich priests and rich bishops and rich cardinals seem to be fleecing them for their hard-earned efforts to work towards salvation. I would argue that was a very powerful motivating factor behind the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. It's no coincidence that John Ball, a priest, would challenge when Adam delved in Eve's span, who was then the gentleman, a radical religious ideal with a political objective. We get a, a focus more on individual belief in the onset of plague, and particularly a sense of mystical union with Christ. And it's worth quoting from Dame Julian of Norwich in her revelation of divine love. She describes a, a mystical scene of the crucifix as such. I saw the blood trickling down under the crown of thorns, hot and fresh and right plenteously, like to the drops of water that fall off the eaves of a house after a great shower of rain. 
This testifies to uh, people wanting to invest a lot more emotional, spiritual energy in objects within their control. Things like this crucifix that no cardinal and no king could touch. It led to a growth in an individual articulation of belief, imagining God in a more human guise, trying to make him a lot more relatable than he had been before. This in itself intertwined with more humanistic trends that would lead to the Renaissance by the 15th century. And yes, the stage was set for even greater changes that would shape the face of Western Christianity forever. So did all these changes pave the way for the Reformation of the 16th century? Not quite. It's a very complicated issue, to say the very least, as to whether these changes in late medieval religious practice directly led to the Reformation. I'm of the mind to say that, sir, no, they did not directly cause the Reformation. They were arguably pre-existing trends prior to the Reformation that the Reformation kind of supercharged and gave new forms. Crucifixes would continue to hold meaning for people long after the religious changes of the 16th century. In particular, the Catholic population, the recusant population of the 16th and 17th centuries, would heavily invest in the value of crucifixes. And uh, worship of the cross was still very much ubiquitous, no matter which side of the religious divide in which you fell. Having said that, the Reformation would not have happened if these changes in religious belief and practice towards a more individualistic and uh, humanistic relationship with God was not already laid. One could say that there was a, a kernel of truth in the egg which Luther hatched. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of 100 Years, 100 Objects. Please do seek out some of our other episodes where we'll look at everything from lithics to lighthouses.